Good morning. Glorious saints of the Most High God of the greatest kingdom on this earth. How are you this morning? Good. Let's turn over into the book of Acts here, chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, I tell people I love it when they, I know, maybe I'm just a little old-fashioned. I like to see people carry Bibles to church, <laughs> I guess. Maybe that, maybe that'll pass one of these days, but I'm sure it's just a, I mean, I use my phone about as much as anybody else these days, so I don't know what I'm complaining about, but it's, uh, I don't know, there's just something about the Word of God that's very special. And uh, I have, I've had times that I've slept with it under my pillow. For long periods of time, I've had times I'd had me a copy. I'd lay on the dash of my truck, ride around with it there. I mean, or lay it in my car, or I don't know. It's just something comforting about having the the Word of God. And I know it's supposed to be in our hearts, but I can't put it. I hadn't quite got it all in there yet. I'm still working on it. But anyway... There's not a whole lot I enjoy. I can't think of anything I enjoy any more than getting together and talking and discussing and studying God's Word. And I thought maybe I would that would wear out a little as I got older, but it's getting worse. It's actually getting worse. Uh, maybe it's because I'm closer to heaven than I used to be, but... Um, I love to be with God's people and discussing His Word. So thank you for being here today as we continue on in this teaching. Uh, we'll start here today in Lesson 24 of uh, Chapter 4. And I like to put a little saying up there. This is Charles uh, Spurgeon. God gave us from, uh, God save us from living in comfort while sinners are sinking into hell. Uh, that's Charles Spurgeon. You can see how our uh, vernacular, if you will, or our conscious or whatever, how it's changed over the years, right? That was common language for Charles Spurgeon. Today, it's a little bit like, what does he mean by that? Uh, I'll let you figure that out. Okay, we're going to start today in chapter 4 of this incredible book of Acts. The book of Acts is <clears throat> it's hard to have a favorite book of the Bible, of course, but the book of Acts is so interesting to me, the way God put it together and why God put it together that way. And what we want to understand that the book of Acts covers 32 to 40 years, 38 years. It covers, just this book covers that many years of time. And when we understand that it's not a book that's speaking about six months or 12 months, it's actually covering 32 to 30 some years of time, <clears throat> then we start looking at it more as a, um, if you look at it more like you're reading a, or reading a novel or reading a book or reading somebody's life, uh, if you will, even though it's the church of 32 years, let's say, you're reading the first 32 years of the life of the church. And when we start looking at it in that linear uh, viewpoint of the scriptures, then it, um, and there's more time between each event than just the next chapter. We realize that there's a lot of, there's a good bit of time in the middle <clears throat> we could start bringing better understanding to the book as we read it. And uh, so as we get here into chapter 4, chapter 2 being what we call the birth of the church, we're into chapter 4 now. Uh, we went over uh, into the first persecution. Uh, we'll start in verse 13. And if you'll turn over to chapter fourteen or 4 and verse 13, <clears throat> the first part of chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, the first part of chapter 4 
is what we call the first persecution. Uh, now we're getting over into they were persecuted in the first part of chapter 4. Now when we start here, uh, they are f forbidden to preach in the name of Jesus. And uh, we can make a lot of applications to our lives even today of the early church and where we are today in, com in a comparison. But in the first part of chapter 4, last part of 3, uh, you know, you've got, uh, chapter 3, you've got a miracle performed, lame man healed. You get in the first part of 4, they're persecuted for the lame man healing. And as they were being ridiculed and persecuted, the lame man was even standing there with them. And they said, well, wait a minute, are, why are you persecuting us for this? Right here's the miracle. We can point to him. So here we find that they switch because they can't really persecute them for the performing of the miracle. So what they start persecuting them for is they're saying, well, you're doing it in Jesus' name instead of the name of God, Jehovah. So they kind of switch. They cannot deny the lame man's been healed. But that just goes to show you that a miracle that, that if, if you want to persecute the church or if you've got a critical spirit, a miracle doesn't cut through a, a critical spirit. Can you hear that? A miracle doesn't cut through a critical... And we think, well, if we just get them here and they can see a miracle. No. With, without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, in any conversation, it is the only thing that will cut through a critical spirit. <clears throat> and here we see a huge critical spirit. And Peter's even going to get into the criticism and why they criticize it. Now, Peter, in the first part of Acts, loves to quote a lot from King David. Peter loves to quote from the Psalms. And he shows how prophetic the Psalms are in relation unto that day. So here as we pick up in uh, verse 13, we see that the preaching in the name of Jesus is forbidden. They denied the miracle or they just turned a blind eye to the man that had been, lame man that had been healed. So now they're going to get them from another legalistic point of view. Now, we need to keep that in mind. Pharisees, Sadducees, basically Sadducees were on the scene here, but the Pharisees were also. And the legalistic mindset starts kicking in here. On what, we got a miracle here. Yeah, but just forget the miracle. Here's what you got to do. Right? Here, and so the miracle wasn't trumping the legalistic mindset. Are you, are you with me? Now, now that's something that's dangerous because Jesus... When it came to the adulterous person or murderer, Jesus had much mercy and grace. Now here's where we get hung up, being a legalist. But Jesus despised hypocrisy. He despised a hypocrite. But he had grace and mercy for an adulteress or murderer, but he didn't like hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? It's a type of pride that takes on the form of legalism. Well, bless God, here's what you're supposed to be doing, and you're not doing it. Can, can anybody hear what the Scriptures are saying here? So can you see, now in the prophetic, we really got to be careful because in the prophetic, we believe that we're given a word of the Lord. And I'm all for the word of the Lord and the prophetic. But you better be sure you're not just being a legalist. Can you hear me? You got to be sure you're not just being a legalist and you're trying to condemn somebody for legalistic reasons. Jesus had... And we'll get into it here in this chapter. 
you'll be introduced to a term, and uh, the scriptures call it great grace. So there's grace, but then there's great grace. So we start seeing upon the early church and upon Peter that he says that, they, that they're operating in great grace. What's great grace? It's grace with a four barrel. It, uh, it's grace with a supercharger for, for younger people. Old timers, it was a four barrel. It's, it's great grace is grace uh, that's been supersized. Great grace is supernatural grace. Now, keep in mind as we read here, the early church was operating under great grace. All right, just keep that in mind. You see Peter, you had the miracle of the lame man. What produces that, we'll see as we'll read. Great grace is what produced that. Is there grace? You can have grace and mercy towards the person that's inflicted or that's in need of a healing or we project grace towards each other. But then there's something called great grace that's spoken that brings healing. Now test what I say. Test the Scriptures as we move through it here of what the Scriptures is speaking of the early church being under great grace. Now, keep that in mind. Now, so as we begin here in this preaching in the name of Jesus, we see here that it's forbidden where it picks up in here uh, at, at verse 13. There again, you had the miracle there. They, wouldn't, they said, yeah, okay, pretty good miracle. <clears throat> but they couldn't, per, they couldn't condemn Peter for the miracle. So now they start trying to condemn him because they say, whose name are you doing? They were trying to trick him and... Of course, they said in the name of Jesus, and last week I spoke about the name of Jesus more, if you were here, on how there's something in, here we got, P Jesus is on the earth and performed miracles. Then Jesus left, he's sitting up there in heaven, and you got Peter and the twelve, and they say, well, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So all of a sudden it's transferred from an individual to where it's invoked in a name that Jesus says we can use His name. He's a voucher for us. And so here we see the name of Jesus. So uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees started catching on. That, <laughs> that lame man was healed just by the using the, invoking the name of Jesus. So what do they switch to? Uh, the preaching of the name of Jesus is forbidden. So they're not as dumb as you might think. <clears throat> I, I submit to the church of Jesus Christ that the Pharisees and Sadducees had more faith in the name. They were scared to death of it than the church of Jesus Christ is today. That's the reason I submitted last week. We've got to understand that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There's a supernatural, there's a great grace upon the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now I can operate and do operate under grace. I can extend grace and mercy. Uh, most of your false doctrine, uh, your false teachings, is extending grace to the hurting. I, and I get that. We got to be it's the, the social justice idea of grace is you help the needy and the poor. I'm all for that. I'm all for that type of grace. But the church of Jesus Christ is to be operating in a great grace, which is a step. In other words, if you're a homosexual listening to me today, there is hope for you to be set free of that. There's hope. I extend unto you the grace of God. Just like I extend to any of us sinners. Good place to say amen. That I extend to any of us sinners. 
But when we can operate and walk in the authority of great grace, then that hope is realized by us sinners in the area that needs healing. Now, that is a true supernatural encounter. Just because you're not experiencing it, do not bring your faith and reality of the kingdom of God down to your experience. Keep it in the area of your faith for. Can somebody hear me? We're, 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 we, have, we go through this psychological game is that if I'm not seeing the miracles of great grace, then it must not mean that. And so therefore I have to justify somehow another that God's great grace isn't operating because if I don't do something, then that means my faith's not real. I submit to you, your faith is not in a man. I mean, your faith is not in you as a man. It's not in your ideas, right? That's not where your faith is. Your faith is in the man, Jesus Christ. It, and it's not in him performing for you. Like doing a dog trick, set, roll over, bark, right? That's just, just, that's just not Jesus. That's not his style, okay? But we got to remember, what is our faith in? Our faith is not sustained by signs and wonders. If it is, you're working through your brain. You're working through your mind. It's a spiritual transaction, if you'll notice, to those of you that are listening to me that are born again, if you'll notice when you wake, you can go to bed at night discouraged. But when you wake up in the morning, if you'll notice, your faith is still intact. It's not because of what you're bringing to the table. It's because of what's imparted to you. You have faith in Jesus Christ, whether you want to admit it or not. When you say you're losing faith in Jesus Christ, it just tells me you're walking in the flesh and not the spirit because it's still in your spirit. For some reason you're listening to your mind, you're listening to the voices instead of to the spirit of the living God. And we do yield from time to time and we go dumb, we go stupid, and we start listening to our brain over our spirit. Am I the only one that's guilty of that? It's a, dangerous, it's a dangerous thing to deal with. So, as, as we see here, the name of Jesus was the issue. And as we keep going through this book of Acts, it's my prayer <clears throat> that we grow in this grace until we reach a point of great grace, as the early church did. And we see the supernaturalness of this supernatural being great uh, grace in a supernatural form is being referred to here in this chapter as great grace. And as a church, listen church, if we never see another miracle as long as we live, it's okay. The only thing I ask is let's sit here still expecting it and waiting on it. Let's don't change the truth of the Word of God to our experience. That's all I ask. If, you, if God's got to validate Himself to you by a miracle, you ain't got it. There was something in the patriarchs of old that could be tied to a pole and set on fire, and they did, they did their experience was proving to them that their faith wasn't worth much. Jesus' example was, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Right? And that happened to a lot of the patriarchs of old as they got burned at a stake. And I will insert this again here. There is a group of people that don't know what they're doing. Now, there's some people just mean as a pit of hell. But I submit to you, that's not the bulk of lost humanity. Most of lost humanity just doesn't know what they're doing. And that's the truth. So, 
What is it that's going to happen there? Hopefully that the grace of God will be submitted into their life and bring a conviction to their heart. Now, the name of Jesus, let me move on. <clears throat> we could talk about the name of Jesus for a long time, but I am expecting, I am expecting in this lifetime that I will experience, I think I had little dew drops here and there of the great grace of God. But I, I'm, I'm living into a time that we can come here as collectively as a congregation and we walk into these doors back here, we walk into the great grace of God. I'm, I'm looking for that. Uh, I'm not looking for anything short of that. I'm expecting that. Do you not think that that's what's needed in the world that we're living in for people to run into the great grace of God? It's that great, great, great grace. You'll also, we'll not get into it today, but there's an example of the great grace of God allows you to endure all things. I'll not, there again, I'm not going to teach it, but I'll, I'll kind of wet your whistle with this. The Hebrew children, fiery furnace, were in the great grace of God. So there's something, a healing in your midst or signs and wonders in your midst is in the mere beginning of great grace. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. It's, mere, it's the mere beginning of great grace. As we, as we mature in great grace, it makes no difference to what's happening around us because we're in the peace of the great grace of God. Are you with me? Now, let's prove this by Scripture. It's in the name of Jesus. In, verse, in chapter 4, verse 13, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John <clears throat> and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, I would be to God to be called unlearned and ignorant if I could walk like Peter and John. They marveled. Have you ever seen a time that you marveled at an ignorant man? Something's going on here. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. In other words, here's the point. They're, not, they're saying they're probably ignorant and stupid. But there's something that's greater than being ignorant and stupid. And that means you've hung out with Jesus. Now, how in the world is hanging out with Jesus? you you got to understand something. When you're not hanging out with Jesus, what's left is ignorant and unlearned. You want to be embarrassed? <laughs> Just don't hang out with Jesus. Because ignorant and unlearned is what we're running into. That's, that's, just, that's the truth. Whether it's me or whether it's you. If I'm not in the Spirit and I haven't been hanging out with Jesus and I'm trying to project into you that I'm a Christian, I end up looking like I'm unlearned and stupid because I'm faking it. It's not coming out of my heart that I've been with Jesus. I'm not responding truly. So if you want to look like you don't have any clothes on, just don't hang out with Jesus. And that's how you're going to learn. That's how you're going to look. And, and also, to the world, this is how we look. Like we're unlearned and ignorant. Why? Because we're not hanging out with Jesus. That's right. You know I'm telling the truth. I think we need to improve on being unlearned and ignorant. Do I? Can I take a vote on that? I think we need to improve on that. There again, the only way we can do it is hang out with Jesus. And what does it mean to hang out with Jesus? That means you come to church, we come in here, or we live life through the week, and we're not a hypocrite. That means we give grace to an adulteress. We give grace and mercy to a murderer. And we don't put up with a, any hypocrisy in our own lives. We're not going to be a hypocrite here. You see, people run into a conflict. Why does Jesus give mercy and grace to an adulteress? But yet we got the laws of, of God here. 
It seems like a conflict. You don't know whether to stand for the laws or give grace or mercy. Am I telling the truth? We get confused. What, what do I do? Well, you got to understand it's not a matter of laws of God and, and given unto an, an adulterous woman. It's about if you're a hypocrite or not. That's what it's about. You who have no sin cast the first stone. Well, they all had to, all the hypocrites had to leave. And I pray to God that He don't make all the hypocrites leave our church houses. <laughs> Have I got a witness? Okay. All right, that, that's enough of that. Okay. Now, they saw them as ignorant or common, uh, but they were confused. Now, if we have the presence of God in this room, and we have new people come in, I don't, I'm hoping they'll be confused because the presence of God's here. The, the most confused I ever was in my entire life, I was raised a Methodist Presbyterian by a Pentecostal mama. I'm just about as much of a junkyard dog in the faith as you can get. I've been crossbred every which way but up. And if you've got this mixture of the faith without the power of the faith, we look pretty stupid. But when you can come in and encounter the presence of God. For the record, the presence of God is a true thing, okay? It's not, well, I'm not making this up. The presence of God is a real thing. And the presence of God is a witness into God's kingdom being in the room. And, and people get confused. Well, I thought Jesus said it was in your heart. Well, I thought the Old Testament said it was a literal kingdom. And so, well, yeah, but he said it was in your heart. So I'm going to go with the heart crowd. And the other one said, I'm going to go with the earth crowd. Listen, Jesus had to put the kingdom in our heart before he could send it to the world. When the new Jerusalem comes, you're already going to have a love for it because he put it in your heart. Right? That's the reason people are against it in Christianity. Well, you shouldn't love America. Well, it's in my heart. It's in my heart. Warts and all, it's in my heart. Well, if, if I'm that way about my country, listen, if you can be that way about a football team, surely to goodness, it's okay to be that way about the kingdom of God. Amen. Right? It's got to be in your heart. So Jesus comes, convicts the heart, brings His presence into us, His presence in us, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope He puts His presence in us so we can identify when His presence is in the room. We can identify with it. So when someone comes in that hasn't, they could even be born again. But you got different types of confusion here under this confused word. You got some people that are just not born again. You got others that are born again, but have never had the, the teaching, the language, or the understanding of the presence of God. Now, the only thing most people know is they, if, if the presence of God's around, they tend to cry. I don't know what the presence of God is, but I tend to cry. Right? And, and that's, that's the way, we, how do we identify with it? It's because, why do we cry? It's because of compassion. Now, if you, I've never seen anybody be a legalist and, and, and legalistically bless somebody out for doing wrong and cry. I, I've just never seen it happen. Why? Because that's not the presence of Christ. There again, remember, Jesus gave mercy to the adulterer, and he despised the hypocrite. Can you hear that? So there's something about that equation that unlocks the Scripture. So here you got Peter. He comes on the scene with this. They said they were ignorant and confused. 
<laughs> they could tell they'd been with Jesus. They knew they had been with Jesus for this filling of the Holy Spirit gave testimony unto it. Now listen, I've had people say to me all the time, Alan, have you ever been filled with the Spirit? I can honestly say, today I have been with the Lord. So yes, I have been. But I can also, you got to associate a filling of the Holy Ghost goes with who you're hanging out with. You tend to be filled with who you're hanging out with. That's right. You can watch, you watch a movie, what, or talk, whatever, convert, just whatever, and you're tend to going to be filled with that spirit. So therefore, people will know if we are filled with the spirit. Now let me move on. Talking about preaching of Jesus is forbidden. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, see that? They could say nothing against it. So they had the man standing there. But when they had commanded them to go, out, uh, go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So those that are critical of him, they're denying, they're, they're saying we can't deny it, so what are we going to do about it? They never deny the miracle. They could not, for the man was standing right there in their midst. Verse 17, but that it spread no further among the people, he didn't want it to go viral, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man, man in his name. So here they're not denying the miracle. But we don't want it to go viral. So, let's shut down his name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. First recorded account of political correctness. You're welcome. First recorded account of political correctness. Holy Ghost says, I don't need to elaborate on that. <laughs> that wasn't for you, that was for me. I'd probably go south. I could, t I could tell it. Now, political correctness is usually covering up the truth. I'm sorry, but that's what it is. In your mind, you think you're standing for something but technically it covers up the truth. It should be called the political cover-up, I call it. It's not political correctness, it's the political cover-up. All right, let's move on quickly here. So in Acts 4, 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto our God. And they said, Okay, and so we listen to you more than we do God. Judge ye. Said, Y'all judge it. For we cannot speak the things which ye have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing <coughs> how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which, he, which was done. For the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been shown. Now, with that said, I am not against miracles. I am for them and all the problems that they bring. You'll have one healing and 500 problems. You do realize that. Do you not? You think that the miracle or the healing is going to convince the critical. It's not. It takes the convicting power of the Holy Ghost to convict a heart. You don't do it by sight in your brain. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's move on here. Now we're going to move in the next part of this chapter where it picks up the topic, starts shifting a little bit more. It's the Christians again filled with the Spirit. So you know about the filling of the Spirit in Acts 2. Did you know about the filling of the Spirit in Acts 4? So we'll get on into it here, and it shows up towards the end of the chapter. 
the Christians again filled with the Spirit. In verse 23, And being let go, they let him go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. What was happening? They went back, gave a report. Everybody there, you, you, you had a Rome representative, you had Jewish rep representative, you had all kinds of dignitary there that was giving them their rights to hush on using the name of Jesus. They gave them all of these rights and then they let them go. Why? Because the people saw the miracle. They were believing Peter. It was the leaders that were in trouble. Now, we're waiting for that to happen in the United States. The leaders are in trouble. I'm looking for the believers, for non-believers to get saved, and for non-believers to be sympathetic to the believers, and that we run these leaders off that are leading in such a terrible way our nation today. I'm not for evolution, but I'd rather have a orangutan in, in Washington more than some of the people we have. And that was not the Lord, that was me. And yes, I ventured off right there. <laughs> now, what happened after this? It says they went into a prayer meeting of praise. Here they were told to shut down. They were ridiculed. But the power of God was with them. They had great grace. They had a miracle to even prove it. They gave, went by and gave the report of the government. And they broke out in a prayer meeting. Isn't that something? There's something about the people of God that under persecution were not to run, were to grow. There's something supernatural there again, I think it's a funny movie, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? But Clooney was sitting there, and they, I forget what had happened. He didn't have any of his hair cream. He couldn't get none. He had some people after him. He looked at his cohorts and said, boys, we're in a tight spot. I think that's where the church today is. We're in a tight spot. But the church historically grows when it's in a tight spot. Like Israel when everything's great, we tend to get fat, sassy, and lazy. Like the nation Israel in Egypt. The Pharaoh looked at Israel and said, there's getting to be too many of them. He said, cut the rations and put up their, uh, I want more brick made. I want to increase their production and give them less, less ration." So that's what they did. So Israel had to make more brick and they got less food. Israel kept growing, kept multiplying. Listen, what happened was Israel kept getting stronger because they had to make more brick. Don't underestimate God preparing you for the big day. Hardships of today are just preparing us for a bigger day, for a bigger time. Do not fold under it. When we respond correctly, it makes us stronger in the spirit. The stronger in the spirit you are, the, the, more, the, the greater the opportunity for you to be able to walk in great grace. You're walking in grace. But God's preparing you to walk in great grace. So here we see they went back. It just brought about a good prayer meeting. They were aware they were talking directly with God. They were acknowledging God as the ultimate creator. The Sadducees were materialistic. Now here's the odd part, part. God created all the material stuff that they were materialistic about. <laughs> That's right. But we're going to kick God out now because we got all this. It's, we're, we're, we're just so dumb. 
When materialism fails to bring satisfaction, most turn to a type of mysticism. Because materialism will not bring, the, it never brings the satisfaction. Look at those that have arrived. They're always disappointed. But this, and, and it's amazing how people turn to mysticism because the things that people believe in mysticism, uh, Christianity is much easier. It's much more believable. But it's not that mankind can't, it's that mankind won't. They refuse. Now, look at it here again in verse 5. We've got a few minutes, 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David. Now here Peter hath said. Now Peter, real quickly, I'm going to go through a few slides quickly. Peter starts referring again to David. He loves the Psalms. He keeps quoting from the Psalms on and off. But he knows that the Psalms are prophetic unto the future. That's what he knows. He said, David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Peter's taking that out of Psalms, applying it to him that day. Well, if Peter can do it, I can too. That shows us God's Word has the ability to pay it forward. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been to McDonald's, you've seen it, and somebody pays it forward? Yeah, that per yeah, go ahead and pay. That's called paying it forward. God's Word has the ability to pay forward. So Peter was paying it forward, so to speak. He was saying, right here it is, right here it is, this is what you're seeing. Now it's amazing to me how the Scriptures are so prophetically on fire when you realize that Scripture pays forward, so to speak, it's amazing to me how it can look like it was written just for today, and it just so happens that today it is for just today, but yet it was for a day years ago. But it's just as true. Try doing that with a piece of pie and see how long it works. It'll rot, go rot on you, won't it? God's Word doesn't. Prophetically, you've got to understand how God's created the Scriptures. Uh, and the easy one is, you must be born again. It works the same right now as it did 2,000 years ago. It's just as alive today. So you've got to understand that about the Scriptures. It's not just a historical do document. It is the true, ultimate, mystical document. People say, well, Alan, you can't hunt, and, you can't open up the Bible and put your finger on it and apply it to your life. I beg your pardon. I just beg your pardon. If that was the only verse in the Bible, you can do that and God will have it for your life. Why? It's a mystical book. So Peter knows that he reaches back and said, right here it is again. That's what's going on. You can do the same thing in your life. That's so you can hear the preacher preach, or I can be up here, and I can say something, another preacher can say something. Hadn't got a thing to do with what you're going through, and the Holy Ghost says, that right there is for you. And then at the end of the meeting, you come up to the preacher and said, I feel like you're preaching right to me. I've had it happen hundreds of times. have no idea what you're talking about, but I know that the Holy Ghost is applying words to the hearts of His people. That's mystical. That's supernatural. Peter's given us that example here when he loves to use David uh, for that. On the house of prayer, we we'll use the book of Psalms. The reason I use it is because it's such a prophetic book. It's so prophetic uh, in nature. So he said, David has said, the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things. Here we see Peter referring to Psalm 2. Now let's look at it, just a few little things. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? He's quoting that. The king of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Might be happening now. Wonderful time to say amen if you agree. The king of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. 
Don't be surprised. Don't walk into here and say, I'm surprised uh, the world's against me. Uh, duh. Okay. Let's, let's not do that one, lest we look ignorant. And uh, let us break their bands asunder. I like that. And cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. What does, what does derision mean? What does it mean here in Psalm 2? It says, says the Lord will have them. It says he's going to, laugh, he's going to have them. What does, I'm going to show you something that's an attribute of the Lord. And, and, and you're, going, you're going to say, no, that's not the Lord. There are four incidents where God laughs in the Old Testament. Three in the Psalms, and once in the Book of Wisdom, Proverbs. In each case, it is a laugh of derision. God is looking at the plotting and evil way of people and laughs at them. That didn't hit y'all like it did me. I said, God, you got to be kidding. I thought he was worried about it. I thought he was sweating just a little. God, have you looked at the scoreboard lately? According to the news, we're running behind God. God says, I'm laughing. Now, if God's laughing at this evil, he must know something the rest of us don't. If he's laughing, he's pretty sure-footed. Now, let's move on. I've got just three minutes here. I'm going to try to do this one. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. <coughs> now that phrase is important. Did you know there's not any word in the Word of God that's just there as a filler? Every word's important. All of those names there are very important. Here we see Peter stating that Herod and Pilate, see one time they weren't with the Jews, but they, he, they joined the Gentiles and Israel against Christ. They did, at the beginning tried to get out of it, but, soon, but later they joined it so it could happen. And so he's making that, stating this document here, that they joined them. Here we see represented the Hebrew authority, which is Herod, the Roman authority, which is Pilate, the nations, which is the Gentiles. Uh, so we see here that all of mankind has been represented in this statement, and that's the reason we say all of us are guilty of hanging Jesus on the cross, right? <clears throat> and I will have to stop on this one. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thou counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal. Now, I'm going to go back. We're going after some great grace in this congregation. Check me in 20 years if I'm still here and you'll let me preach. I'm going after great grace for this congregation. Now, he says, uh, 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and great uh, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. He said, grant unto thy servants. Anybody won't be numbered there. Okay. <clears throat> grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal. Okay, stretch forth the hand to heal. And, and that signs and wonders may be done by the, the name of the holy child Jesus. So it says, with all boldness they may speak thy word. So there, there's, there's a combination to the word there. What is it? Boldness. Right? He says, with boldness. So you're going to add boldness to the Word. For some reason, boldness 
is of necessity to pull off the application of this word. That's, that's what he's saying. Now, by stretching forth on hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of the Holy Child, Child Jesus. Now, I used to have a... Have you ever been around anybody that's uh, is any, uh, praying for demons to come out of somebody? Okay, I didn't think I had many. There's one or two, but that one's under six, so surely not. Uh, okay, here's one. Yeah, we got a few. Now, have you ever noticed... Have you ever... Is it, it's really hard to be quiet when you pray for healing. You like to say, in the name of Jesus, uh, rise up and walk. There's just something comes over you when you're anointed by the Holy Ghost, you tend to get a little loud. You don't have to. I'm just saying it's a human condition of the presence of God. You tend to get a little loud, a little bold when you're stretching out your hand. Now, I know a lot of you think you don't, but I've heard you and you do. <laughs> just so you'll know. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Look at that where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Again, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with what? Yes. Okay. Here they are. They spoke the Word of God with boldness. So much it shook the place. Now you say, well, is that a little shaken or just the people? I don't care. I think the people were shaken so much that they were shaking the place. That's what I think. Now listen, church, maybe we're not shaking today, today, but this old boy's praying that we do. Now, I've got to finish this. Can you give me two minutes? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Here we see that boldness is a sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Didn't say speaking in tongues. Said boldness is a sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, boldness doesn't have decimals. Boldness is something within that you're getting ready to do something that you wouldn't normally do. That's called boldness of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy Ghost says, go over there and talk to that person. Say, can I pray for you? Whatever. And you're sitting there like this thinking, there is no way I can do that. But the boldness of the Holy Ghost comes upon you if you I double dare you to ask for it. That's what I do. Now, we see the boldness here with all boldness to speak thy word. Boldness there come upon him in 31. Boldness is a mark of spirit empowerment in Acts 2, 14 through 41. And is granted in response to prayer amidst persecution. Paul prays to increase in boldness. And in each instance, boldness is not a general character attribute, but a specific grace for proclaiming the Word. Are you with me? That means that this great grace, when it starts coming upon us, will cause you to do things you would not normally do. Now that doesn't mean you're just trying to be crazy for crazy's sake. Most of us has got enough of that. This is a boldness to speak forth and to move under the power of the Holy Spirit. And it just so happens that's what's called great grace comes upon boldness to speak His Word. And I've got people coming in here who's never heard me before and I'm going to scare them, so I'm going to hush. <laughs> they come right in at the great grace point. So let's all stand. We'll pick up here again next week. So Lord Jesus... You know our deal, Lord. I pray if there's anything that I've said is not of you, I pray that it would fall to the ground. But Lord, if I've said anything's of you and of your spirit, I pray, oh God, that this boldness, this supernatural boldness, not man-made boldness, but I pray that supernatural boldness would come upon this people, those that are watching online, the people of this congregation of new life. I pray that great boldness would be upon us to speak your word. Not as a hypocrite, but as an agent of the Holy Spirit. Agent of the Holy Spirit. So Lord Jesus, I ask and pray that you'd anoint this crowd in great grace. 
great grace of the kingdom of God, that we might be guilty of living in the kingdom of God, this side of glory. Lord, give us something we can talk about in a thousand years. Let us say, do you remember when we were back there and, and your great grace come upon us and we did things that wasn't even possible, Lord, because you was with us. Lord, it's our prayer you'll save the lost today. It's our prayer that you'll heal the sick. And it's our prayer you'll give peace to those that have no peace. And the people that were longing for great grace said, Amen, Amen. Thank you.